Oil and natural gas prices fell in trading on Wednesday ahead of inventory reports for both commodities that are uh, due out today. Oil right now is hovering around $78 a barrel. It has taken a beating on China's move to crack down on bank lending. Natural gas is uh, somewhere around 555 per million BTU. Elliot Gu is back. He is from the Energy Strategist and the Energy Letter. Good to see you again, Elliot. Good to be here. Um, tell me about uh, prices tumbling Wednesday. Was that a, was, a, was a lot of that about um, China's move? Also, uh, U.S. equities overall took a tumble. Yeah, I think that was definitely uh, one of the factors behind both the fall in stocks and the fall in energy prices. Is just that uh, you know China has been a big growth driver. Um, it's kind of led the world economy out of recession over the last year, um, and uh, you know it would be a concern if uh, you know if it started to slow down. You know, I tend to think that the Chinese tend to be very gradualist uh, in changes in policy. Um, so I don't think it's going to derail the recovery there at all. All right. So we have the oil inventory report out today, which is a day late. Uh, what do you see there? Are you expecting a rise in stocks? Yeah, it looks like we're going to get a rise in crude oil um, and gasoline stocks. Uh, it looks like uh, we might get a flat number on the distillate side, um, and that's probably driven by pretty strong demand for, uh, for heating oil. Uh, but it does look like we'll get a rise in uh, in both the other two products, the two major products. Um, you know, generally though, you know, inventories have been uh, sort of normalizing gradually uh, over the last several months, not only in the U.S. but really across the developed world. So, what does that say about the demand? Does it does it remain weak? Um, it looks like the U.S. demand uh, is pretty flat now on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, in some products, it's actually growing a little bit year-over-year. -year. Others, it's down a little bit. Uh, but it looks like demand is uh, is pretty flat year-over-year. Um, I think as we start to move into 2010, as the economy does start to firm up a little bit, uh, we'll see, see some very modest growth in, in, in U.S. oil demand. Um, and again, you know, the real strength in growth, and you know, again, the reason why we saw a dip yesterday, is uh, growth in demand from the emerging markets. Do you have any sense that the rise in prices was a bit overdone, as some are saying, and this is just merely a, a simple pullback? Uh, I think that's. I think that's very much. I think that's very likely to be the case. Um, one of the things that was interesting about the recent rally in oil. Um, is that the dollar has also been quite strong generally um, over the last uh, four or five weeks. Um, so it hasn't been just totally a function of people buying uh, commodities to hedge against a weaker dollar. Um, it's obviously been based on some change in the fundamental um, supply-demand balance or some uh, perceived change in the, in the fundamental supply-demand balance. And I think that will continue to be the case throughout the year. Okay. What is your sense? We have natural gas inventory report coming out now. There was a big drawdown last week. Do you expect a drop in inventories? I do. I expect another very large, uh, historically large drop, uh, probably something on the order of 230 billion cubic feet. Um, you know, last, uh, last week's uh, number uh, was, I believe, the second highest on record in terms of a drawdown. Um, and it's really amazing to think that just three months ago, you know, we were talking about you know, where exactly uh, natural gas inventories would top out. Um, you know, if the U.S. would actually run out of storage. And as of last week, we're only about 121 billion cubic feet uh, above the five-year average, mm. um, which is really, uh, you know, if we do get a number on the order of 230 billion cubic feet, that would actually put us right back um, at that average uh, or maybe even a little bit below average. Um, I don't think there were very many analysts at all forecasting three or four months ago that we would, uh, you know, end this, uh, this season's uh, heating season you know, at below average inventories or even at average inventories. So Most people thought we would be above average. It's all been about the weather? It has been all about the weather. Um, you know, across not only in the U.S., uh, but if you look at Europe, um, it's been the coldest winter in places like the U.K. Uh, since 1977. If you look at uh, inventories of natural gas uh, in storage in the U.K., um, they're actually very tight, um, and, and prices have been rising there. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's going to also help out over the summer. If inventories are low there, uh, then you're going to see a lot more of that LNG, that liquefied natural mm -hmm. gas, head to Europe and Asia rather than um, coming to the United States to help fill up our storage. Right. So for now, y you say we are uh, sort of out of that uh, storage capacity danger zone? Oh, I think we are. I think that, uh, you know, provided that we don't get a major warm up through the remainder of, of the heating season, and remember, um, it's been a really early cold snap uh, in the winter this year. Um, you know, we still have weeks and weeks ahead of us uh, that we're probably going to see drawdowns. Uh, so there, if we get another cold snap, things could get tight very quickly. Um, and I think it will be very interesting to watch the production side as well. Um, you know, obviously a lot of this is demand-led. Uh, we've seen an uptick in probably in industrial demand and also in heating demand. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if we do see 
uh, flat to declining natural gas production as a result of the big slowdown in drilling we saw starting in the summer of 2008 and extending up through really the summer of 2009. Right. Um, and those should start to show up in the numbers released from the EIA uh, here over the next couple of months. Uh, there was a lot of noise at the end of last year because of pipeline shut-ins and other things that affected uh, how those production figures are, co are collected. But I do think that's something that we're going to start to see uh, more apparent as we move into the spring. Let me take you back to oil for one second because I wanted to get your take on a new um, Credit Suisse forecast out that's, that pretty much calls for uh, no volatility for crude oil prices uh, this year and next. It pretty much says OPEC will produce when needed. Uh, any, any big impact there? What's your take on that forecast? Uh, well, you know, I, OPEC is, uh, I mean, basically what you're seeing in OPEC right now is that there's a lot of cheating going on. Um, you know, it's, uh, the compliance has really fallen off uh, sharply since last spring. Um, you know, that's 100% a function of higher oil prices. Um, you know, when oil prices were sort of at $30, $40, you know, every OPEC state was panicked, and they were all more than willing to comply with, uh, you know, uh, the drop-off in, in production quotas. Uh, now that oil prices are rising, it's very tempting to go out and pump a little bit more oil. Um, and so, you know, OPEC is already, even though their headline quota hasn't changed, they already are producing more oil um, to meet demand. Um, I think what you're going to see... Uh, as we move forward over this year, next year, and, and, and past that, you're going to see gradually OPEC spare capacity, uh, the amount of oil they have in reserve, production that they have in reserve, gradually decline. Um, I tend to be in the camp that thinks that sometime by around 2012, 2013, we're going to be getting back down to where capacity, spare capacity, mm -hmm. is very, very tight, similar to what we saw in the summer of uh, 2008. Um, when you know oil prices really spiked and capacity was you know less than two percent of daily demand spare right. capacity. Well, I just want to get your take on this uh, big oil and gas team up Exxon Mobil and XTO Energy and uh, any comment on yesterday's hearing and and do you see Elliot um, um, policy about to get tougher on hydro fracking? You know I think that's been an issue that's been uh, very much overblown. Um, you know you read uh, you know you read a lot of the uh, of the stories about it in the in the industry press and in analyst reports and whatnot. And there really doesn't seem to be uh, that much concern that's actually that huge of an environmental impact. Uh, but, you know, whenever there's a story about shale gas in, you know, mass market media type newspaper, um, you know, that, that uh, environmental issue kind of goes front and center. So I think it's, it's really more of a, of a perception thing than a, real, than a real problem. I don't see Congress, um, you know, making major uh, uh, game-changing regulations on, on hydrofracking. Um, you know, the XCO Exxon merger... Uh, you know, is really a function of two things. You know, Exxon sees huge upside in, in demand for natural gas. Um, you know, uh, as starting this year, perhaps, we'll start to see a lot more legislative push behind demand for natural gas. And I think that Exxon also sees a lot of opportunity overseas. Um, they have a lot of shale lands in places like Hungary, Germany, Poland. Um, and obviously, they want to take the technology that they're essentially buying from XTO and apply it overseas as well. There's a, a big opportunity to do the same types of things we're doing here uh, in other countries. Right. The shale story has, uh, has gone global. All right, Elliot Gu, thank you so much for your insight from the Energy Strategist and the Energy Letter. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll see you next time.